Here's why the Gulf of Mexico dead zone is extra large this year. Low oxygen areas appear yearly off the coast of Louisiana, but 2017's dead zone is reportedly the largest ever documented since records began in 1985. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration announced that this year's dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico measures 8,776 square miles, which is roughly the size of New Jersey. The 2002 dead zone covered nearly 8,500 square miles, but the past five years have seen the area cover no more than an area less than 6,000 square miles. Dead zones are caused by nitrogen and phosphorus, which are used as crop nutrients by farmers and washed into waterways by rain. Unusually heavy rains in the Midwest are believed to have washed away more nutrients from U.S. farmlands than usual, sending them downstream via the Mississippi River. Nitrogen and phosphorus stimulate massive algal growth in the Gulf that eventually sinks to the bottom and decomposes. This decomposition process uses up the oxygen in the water, which renders the area uninhabitable for marine creatures. Dead zones are usually temporary, dissipating during fall and winter. But the effects of low oxygen or hypoxic zones on certain species can be permanent, with studies showing it affects fish reproduction and stunts shrimp growth. Setting a federal limit on the use of crop nutrients may be one possible solution, but could prove challenging since it will need to be implemented in more than 25 states. Don't let YouTube ad bots dictate what Tomo News reports. Support us at patreon.com slash Tomo News. We're killing the seas and oceans. Instead of eating plankton, young fish are now eating plastic. About 8 million tons of plastic are leaked into the ocean annually, and its impact on the fragile underwater ecosystem has scientists worried. A new study has found that young fish are eating microplastic like junk food, and it's killing them. Microplastic particles result from the fragmentation of large plastic waste, or from tiny manufactured plastic like microbeads in cosmetic products. Measuring less than 5 millimeters, the particles flow through waterways and into the ocean, accumulating in shallow coastal areas. Larval perch that normally feed on plankton have been found to be actively choosing the microplastic as food. This has resulted in their stunted growth and sudden disregard for the smell of predators. The ability to respond to the smell of predators and flee is typically innate in young fish. When placed in tanks with their natural predator, perch that ate plastic were preyed upon four times faster than those that did not. All were dead within 48 hours. Scientists warn that the harmful effects of plastic is not limited to fish and may be felt throughout the food chain. The study is an important step in understanding the silent threat that plastic wastes poses on marine creatures. A U.S. ban on microbeads in body care products will take effect from July 2017, with pressure building for other countries to follow suit. Toxic red tide of biblical proportions plagues Chile. Chile's growing red tide crisis is threatening not only marine life, but also communities that depend on the sea for their livelihood. Red tide is a commonly recurring phenomenon in Chile but the outbreak that has grown rapidly along the southern coast in the past weeks is one of the worst ever recorded. The toxic microalgae blooms that have turned waters red are lethal to birds and marine creatures. Consumption of contaminated seafood is also poisonous to humans. With tons of dead fish and shellfish washing up on shore, fishermen are left with no means to sustain a living. Scientists point to El Nino's key role in the outbreak, with warming ocean waters, creating a friendly environment for algal blooms. But locals are blaming salmon farms that dumped contaminated fish into the sea and possibly worsened the bloom. Angry fishermen have taken to the streets to protest, even as the government declared an emergency zone and offered each affected family 300,000 Chilean pesos. Global warming is killing our oceans. A new study predicts that within 15 to 20 years, human-caused deoxygenation will be felt across the world's oceans. With climate change warming seawaters, oxygen levels in the world's oceans are beginning to drop, 
Surface water with higher temperatures absorb less oxygen. Such surface water is also more buoyant, so oxygen is less likely to make it into deeper water. The resulting conditions are dangerous to marine ecosystems, which depend on oxygen for survival. With the threat already underway, changes in the southern Indian Ocean and parts of the Pacific and Atlantic will be felt as early as 2030. Oceans in eastern Africa, Australia and Southeast Asia, however, won't feel the impact until the next century. Worsening the effects of deoxygenation is an increase in carbon dioxide, causing oceans to be more acidic and less habitable. Researchers say carbon emissions must be reduced if we want to slow the oxygen loss. But monitoring and understanding where the oxygen levels are dipping and how it's impacting our waters is also key. Hey, Tomo Sapiens! Help us beat the ad bots by joining our Patreon news squad at patreon.com slash Tomo News. The Pacific Ocean is full of plastic waste. Initial results from the first aerial survey of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch suggest that ocean pollution is worse than we thought. The Ocean Cleanup Foundation is conducting a series of aerial surveys over an area of plastic accumulation in the Pacific Ocean between Hawaii and California. Flying at low altitude and low speed, the survey uses LiDAR technology to analyze the density and frequency of plastic ocean debris Recording the presence of debris larger than half a meter by one and a half meters, the crew found more than a thousand pieces of plastic during a two and a half hour test flight. The survey also aims to document discarded fishing nets known as ghost nets, which are difficult to detect and can ensnare marine life. Researchers from the Great Ocean Cleanup said understanding the scope of the problem would help future efforts to remove trash from the Pacific. Toxic mud flowing from Collapse Dam in Brazil has reached the Atlantic Ocean. Toxic mud from a collapsed iron mine dam in Brazil that's traveled more than 500 kilometers down the Rio Doce River has reached the Atlantic Ocean. 60 million cubic meters of iron ore waste, enough to fill 25,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools, engulfed districts and contaminated rivers in Brazil earlier this month. Toxic substances at levels exceeding human consumption levels have been detected in the contaminated mud. Samarco, the mine owner, has erected nine kilometers of floating barriers to protect the river bank. Officials have also been widening the mouth of the river to allow the mud to flow faster into the ocean, where it will become diluted. Specialists say the mud will threaten many species of marine life that feed and breed near the river mouth. More than 600 people have been affected by the toxic mud. 11 people were killed and 12 people remain missing. Fishers and farmers that live along the river have been severely affected by the disaster, with biologists saying it could take 30 years to clean up the basin. Oh, humans, what have we done? Despite having a population of no people, one of the most isolated and inaccessible islands on the planet is covered in our garbage. Henderson Island is a remote atoll located on the western edge of a circular system of ocean currents known as the South Pacific Gyre. Named a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1998, the island is uninhabited. However, researchers say it has the highest density of plastic waste in the world. Some 38 million pieces of garbage have washed up on Henderson Island's once pristine sands. Analysis of the trash shows it was carried there from Asia, South America, Europe, the US and Russia. Researchers estimate that 3,500 pieces of trash wash up on the island daily and typically include household items made of plastic. Nearly 30 years ago, UNESCO said Henderson Island's near pristine ecosystem was of immense value for science. But wildlife, including turtles and crabs, have been devastated by the garbage that has been dumped on the island's shores. Researchers say that trying to clean the island's beaches would be pointless because of the lack of visitors and sheer volume of trash that washes up there daily. They advise people to use alternatives to plastic, such as bamboo toothbrushes and canvas carrier bags, and to bring your own mug to Starbucks. Coral bleaching is killing the Great Barrier Reef. Scientists are warning that vast swaths of Australia's stunningly beautiful Great Barrier Reef may never recover from repeated coral bleaching. The Great Barrier Reef is 2,300 kilometers long and covers an area of more than 344,000 square kilometers. This is similar to the size of Japan. However, studies suggest the reef is under threat from repeated bleaching of its corals caused by rising sea temperatures. 
Corals are marine animals that live in compact colonies of tiny identical individual polyps. Coral polyps produce a limestone skeleton. Layering that takes place over hundreds of years by millions of polyps creates a scaffolding, better known as a reef. Most corals get their food from the microscopic algae that live inside their tissue. The algae convert energy from the sun into food, mostly in the form of sugar. It is the algae that provide coral reefs with their vibrant color. Coral bleaching mainly occurs when a rise in sea temperatures causes the algae to produce toxins. In self-defense, the corals then expel the algae, which exposes their limestone skeleton. Corals can recover if there's a subsequent drop in water temperatures, but without the algae, they risk starving to death. Scientists have warned for decades that burning fossil fuels releases greenhouse gases that warm the oceans and put coral at risk. In turn, that jeopardizes the marine ecosystem, including fish that rely on the reefs to protect them from predators. This could in turn spark a food shortage, because hundreds of millions of people worldwide rely on reef fish as their primary source of protein. In order to reduce ocean temperatures and give bleached reefs a chance to recover, greenhouse gas emissions must be reduced. Greenhouse gas emissions can be cut by reducing meat consumption and using solar and electric energy instead of fossil fuels. So if we want future generations to enjoy the beauty of the Great Barrier Reef, it seems it really is up to us.